Well, good morning and welcome. We are continuing on a series we started off a few weeks ago uh, called Hashtag Blessed. The idea behind the, uh, the sermon series was to, t- to walk through the Beatitudes. Um, can we go over there? Okay, can we go to the very front, uh, f- top slide? We start off the series looking at the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he begins to lay out for us his idea of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Now, remember I said to you uh, time and time again that when you look at Jesus' teaching, you'll be surprised of actually what he actually talks about. A lot of people look at Jesus and say, this is what Jesus talked about, right? But Jesus actually talked about the kingdom of heaven and trying to tell people, this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. This is how we want to put together the kingdom of heaven. Ah, perfect. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 7 to 8. And this was the, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Remember, I said to you last week about these two connected to each other. The blessed are the merciful receiving mercy didn't seem like it stood alone, but actually as I began to study, I saw the connection to it. And what it was is that mercy was the action, purity was the reaction, right? As we act merciful, and remember I said to you, the definition of mercy in this, in this particular uh, context was Jesus telling his disciples that mercy is, is seeing people in their misery and acting upon it hungry, naked, uh, homeless, right? Like this was the, the mandate that, the, uh, that Jesus gave his disciples. And Jesus said that when you act in this way, that your heart is purified, that your spirit is purified. And this because of that, you get to see God. We looked at Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus uh, tells a story about the righteous, right? He says, then the righteous will, uh, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you, right? The word righteous, I remember I talked about last time, was this concept of the pure, right? By acting merciful, the pure saw God. Because now look at what Jesus says there in verse 40. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. We see God when we act mercifully because those needing mercy is a reflection of the image of God. So mercy is the action. Purity was the reaction. And that's what we talked about uh, last week. I came across this really interesting uh, quote by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut says this, Many Christians demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. I haven't heard one of them demand that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom. Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. What I find very interesting about the Beatitudes as I begin to kind of study them is that we can sometimes look at the Bible and we can take it and we can turn it around. Right? We can look at the Ten Commandments and say, yes, these are important, and they are the Decalogue, these are the foundation of the law, right? And we can look at it and say, okay, this is how I can negotiate with the law. If I act this way, then I am fulfilling it. But Jesus taught his disciples, it's the heart that I'm actually concerned about. Stop acting this way, but having your heart far from me. The Beatitudes don't allow us that. It is very difficult to read, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are those who mourn. But like, it's, it's very difficult to approach the Beatitudes and, and, and make them say what you want them to say because they are so concise in regards to how they approach the kingdom of heaven that it is no wonder to me as I've studied this a little bit more and more that people don't want to talk about this very often because it is really the opposite of what can be called North American Christianity. And remember I said to you that the Beatitudes seen by the early church wasn't just fortune cookies, right? You open a fortune cookie, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, that's very nice, right? The Beatitudes actually were this process the early church saw as steps towards Christ's likeness, right? And so every week we've been talking about this, and when we wrap this up in a couple of weeks, I'm going to kind of bring it all together there. But when you start at the very first Beatitude, you start off with this idea of salvation, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Because there's the kingdom of heaven. That's the beginning point of Christianity. That's the beginning point of being a disciple of Christ is that you must recognize the poverty of your spirit and see that you need something more, right? For those of you who have ever been in a point in your life where finances are an issue, and by those of you, I mean all of us, 
right? It's like, okay, if I could just have some money, if you have a situation where you're trying to pay bills, I remember back when I was in seminary, there was many times where like, you know, the bills would come for uh, the books or the semester. You're like, ah, right? But if someone came along to me and said, hey, I'll take care of your debt. I wouldn't say, no, 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 no. I, it's, it's mine. I would have gone, well, okay. What do you want for it? Like, you know, is there, like, but this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, right? The poor in spirit are those who say, you know what? I have a debt. I have a need. I have an emptiness. I have a void of a vacuum in my life and only God can fill it. And every step you go, so poor in spirit, the mourning and comfort, the meek inherit, the hunger and the righteous, the mercy and purity. This is all a movement from internal transformation to external behavior, right? And as we keep continue on, next week, we're going we're gonna to finish off the last beatitude. The week after that, we're going to tie it all together. But what we see here is that the transformation happens first internally. Before we can act in a certain way, we must first make sure the internal part of us is, is, is in the correct position. Now, here's what's interesting. You cannot circumvent these steps. Oftentimes, I hear people talk about the mercy piece, Right? We should act merciful, and that is true, and that's absolutely true. But what Jesus says is before you get to the mercy, first deal with on the inside first. Right? Belief must precede behavior, or else behavior becomes a mimicry of what we think God is. And what God wants to do is he wants to transform our entire being, not just the external pieces of it. Right? And so when we understand that, we realize the Beatitudes aren't just simply these fortune cookies, these, these nice sayings by Jesus. And it is no wonder that Matthew's gospel starts off with the Sermon on the Mount. Because he recognizes in this, 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 this teaching that it's going to take the Torah, right? Remember, Matthew's gospel was written to the Jewish people, the Jewish culture. That's why Matthew chapter 1 is a genealogy. Right? What Matthew wanted to first establish is Jesus' Jesus's Messiah, right? this, this, this person that the Jews were waiting for to come relieve them, to, to release them from the oppression. So Matthew's first chapter is like all these names, and you look at it as Gentiles going, oh, names, right? Like I can't even pronounce some of them. But Matthew's like, no, no, no. To the Hebrews, these names are important because it makes Jesus' connection to Abraham and to David that much more clear. But then it gets to Matthew 5, and he takes this, this teaching, and he turns the kingdom of heaven upside down, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And remember I said to you that in each beatitude, there's a oh no, aha moment, right? The oh no is the first piece, right? The blessed are the poor in spirit. You're like, oh no, right? But then the second piece is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're like, aha, Right? The oh no, aha. That's what each beatitude has in its, in its, in its, its working. So as we've looked at this series, and as we're going to wrap it up soon, I have realized that there is so much more depth to these beatitudes than I have ever uh, realized. And I actually realized something. I was talking to somebody. I've never actually heard a sermon on the beatitudes, like each individual one. I'm like, why have we as this church missed this? Like, this is the central teaching of Christ as he portrays the kingdom of heaven. Everything else that he would teach and everything else he would do can come back to these, uh, to these uh, pieces. The video clip you saw there was from a movie Invictus. Invictus is a movie about uh, uh, South Africa and Nelson Mandela taking over the reins of it. And the, it's, it's part political, but also part rugby, uh, which, you know, Matt Damon can make it happen, right? Uh, when you think about Nelson Mandela, I, I think of an individual who, in many respects, I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around an individual who spent decades in prison, emerges from that, and wants to bring a reconciliation to this country that's been torn racially, right? And also in, in poverty as well, too. And he approaches this in such a way that he doesn't want to just, he doesn't, doesn't want, he doesn't want to just uh, take the, um, the, uh, the people who live in Africa and just say, the South Africans say, okay, now we're going to overthrow the white people or this ruling class. But he wants to bring everybody to the table for reconciliation. Uh, Nelson Mandela says this, in the end, reconciliation is a spiritual process which requires more than just a legal framework. It has to happen in the hearts and minds of people. Nelson Mandela, when he became the president of South Africa, he wanted to bring everybody to the table and say, this is how we come together and make our country strong. Well, this morning, we're going to look at a beatitude that does the exact same thing. And when I began to think of what a peacemaker looks like, Nelson Mandela came to the very front of my mind in this movie. By the way, great movie. Uh, watch it. It's, it's really well done. Um, 
Although Matt Damon's South African accent's not that great. But the storyline's fantastic because you see Morgan Freeman uh, portray Nelson Mandela. And he's really fighting with two parties. He's fighting with his own party. And he's also fighting with, with the, uh, the former ruling class party. And he's trying to bring them both. And they're both resisting, right? They're both fighting against this idea of reconciliation. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at the next beatitude which is actually a very important one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. As with all the Beatitudes, as you, on the surface as you read this, you say, oh, okay, I think I understand it. But when you go a little bit deeper here, you realize that actually there's a little bit more happening here. Um, in this Beatitude, we see something here. There's something about being a peacemaker that God considers to be an accurate and suitable representation of himself. Something about a peacemaker is something that says, God says, this, this is actually something very close to my own heart, is it, it, whatever a peacemaker is. But here's what's interesting. The word peacemaker here, so whenever you study scripture, whenever you study the Bible, you always take note of something. And what you take note of is when you see a word that's only used one time in the entire Bible, you go, oh, why is that? Right? Because Oftentimes, um, the writers will use language and common language and will, will create themes and patterns. But when you come across a passage of scripture that has the word that's only used one time in its context in the entire scriptures, you step back and go, hmm, why? Right? Why? Because when you look at peacemaker, it can seem like somebody's saying, okay, two people are fighting, right? Let's make peace with them. That's actually not what Jesus is talking about here. The word that Jesus uses here is, uh, uh, excuse me, I have to forget how to say this again. I was practicing last night in front of my computer and it sounded like a crazy person. But Irena um, Popoy, no, Irena Poi, no, Irena Poi. Sure, let's go with that one. Now, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, this word is, it's a conjunction word. It's two words put together that Jesus uses here, which is interesting right? So when we study this word, we realize it doesn't mean peacemaker as in political peace or physical peace as as in war. It means something different. Um, Rick Calvert says this, the peacemaker of whom Christ refers is not one who settles disagreements and disputes of others. This beatitude is a passage on reconciliation and sonship to God and involves the biblical premise of peace with God. So whatever Jesus is saying here, however he understands a peacemaker, it's not about... um, you know, if there's a war in a certain country, you send a negotiator, right? And they, and they will try to broker a peace between two political factions and come together and say, here's what we need, right? Like, we could use more of those people for sure in this world. We need to send a whole boatload of them into America right now for sure, right? We need to bring together two pieces that are separate, right? But that's not what Jesus is talking about. The peacemaker is a spiritual concept, not a physical concept, which makes complete sense when you get to the second part, but we we can't get there yet. We have to kind of unpack this a little bit more. So one of the things we have to realize is when the Bible talks about uh, God, it does so in such a way that kind of says, listen, there is God and this, this, this being, this person who God is, is separate. He's apart from us, right? Um, James, the younger brother of Jesus, and his letter says this, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Now, what James is saying here, and what's very important, this is a theme through the New Testament, is that there is a battle going on. And again, I don't want to get too apocalyptic, but there is a reality that there's a tension between what God wants and what the world wants. And James says, listen, if you want to make the world happy, you will make God unhappy. Because oftentimes the world and God are at two separate parts, are going two separate directions, right? Now, that's not always the case, but in most circumstances, especially with values and worldviews, that's absolutely the case. So James says, listen, if you are friends of the world or if you're too cozy with the world, you are going to find that you are the exact opposite place where God wants you. Now, here's something else as well, too. Jesus is not a peacemaker. He is peace. Now, this is important because when we see this passage in Matthew chapter 10, it kind of puts Jesus' character a little upside down. Because in Matthew 10, Jesus says this, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, classically, people have looked at this like, is Jesus espousing violence? Of course not. Right? Every time people have tried to act violently, Peter in the garden and other times, Jesus is like, no, 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 no. 
my kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, however you express it, it can't be done in violent terms. So traditionally, and again, we get towards the Middle Ages, the Crusades, this scripture was used like, ah, the sword of God. No, 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 no. Because if you just read the next verse, it all of a sudden frames this passage in context. But what's important about this is Jesus is saying something very clear here. That if you follow Christ, you will start to be at war with this world. Right? So look what Jesus says next in verse 35 and 36. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now, what's interesting about this is that the closer you draw to God is the more bizarre you come to the rest of the world. And in North America, we have forgotten that being a Christ follower actually meant that we were going to be going a different direction. So sociologists will tell you that in the 1950s, being a, Christ, uh, being a Christian in Canada and North, in, in the United States was actually so, uh, socially acceptable. As a matter of fact, you would go to church for, for, for business meetings and meet people in your community. Why? Because that's how you became a, a, an important part of the community, right? Church was this veneer of spirituality, and I use that word intentionally, of people going to church, not because of Christ in their hearts, but because socially that's what you did, right? That's what you did. Today, they say to us that going to church actually does the opposite, that more people are now saying going to church is archaic. It's ancient. It's, it's, just, it's passe. You don't need to do it. I can be a Christian and be at home on Sunday morning sleeping in. That's what we're told. And so when we see this, we go, huh, I, 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 what, what do you mean, Jesus? You've come to take two relations apart. The rest of the world understands this very clearly. As a matter of fact, uh, a writer that I've really uh, started to like, a guy by the name of Nabil Qureshi, uh, some of you know who Nabil is. Nabil was uh, firmly a Muslim who became a Christ follower. And when he told his father, who was a Muslim missionary, that he, he was not going to follow Christ, his family rejected him. And Nabil references this in one of his sermons he, he, he spoke on. And he said that I finally understood this passage of scripture because suddenly I have made a stand for, for Christ. And now my family, those relationships who became very important to me, now rejected me. And the world understands this passage way better than we do. Right? But we are starting to get the hints of it. We are starting to find that this culture is becoming way more aggressive in regards to trying to change our belief system, change how we, how we view the world, right? And so we, we are starting to experience it now, and we're seeing a, a reaction to that, and that's a whole different sermon series. But we are seeing now that being friends with the world does mean being enemies with God. And that social acceptance that in the uh, um, 1950s uh, uh, was uh, the fact is no longer it as well, too. Jesus goes on to say this. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus says the primary relationship you should have in your life is with me. And everything else is secondary. And for some of you in this room, you know that when you decide to stand up for Christ, that people around you we're like, really? I have found in my own personal experience that it's more Christians who are more interested in saying, well, just calm down. What do you mean when I get up in the morning and go pray? Like, that's, come on. Like, just calm down, right? There's this, this is pull towards mediocrity in Christianity that just pervades our culture. And that whenever he gets really uh, pa- um, passionate for the Lord and starts sharing the gospel, I remember when I was uh, working at Canadian Tire in, in Waterloo, when it used to be on Weaver Street there, uh, back when I was in high school, I remember came back from a youth retreat, and I was just really excited about the Lord, and I was just like, ha, ah, right? And so I, I was like, you know, in, in, I was in the lunchroom with my Bible open, just daring anybody to talk to me or whatever, right, you know? But I was just like, I just caught a glimpse of that. And I remember another guy that worked at the Canadian Tire, he went to our, my youth group, he's like, dude, just calm. Just put that away, you know? You're embarrassing us, right? It's like this pull towards mediocrity. Jesus says that unless you understand the primacy of my relationship with you, nothing else makes sense. And unless you understand that, you will always be, in, you'll always be on the outside of that relationship. And so 
when they, we talk about peacemaker, we have to make sure that we understand that it's not just simply uh, about being playing nice, but the peace is a spiritual peace. It's a reconciliation peace. In Ephesians 2, it says this, for he himself is our peace. Okay, we get this part now. Who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. See, the hostility the Bible talks about is if you're friends with the world, you are hostile towards God. See, sometimes the conversation within Christianity is, how can I have both? Because I really want to have both. I really want to have God or just enough of God to make me feel somewhat bad, but not too bad. Not to act kind of crazy, right? But I also want to have the world as well too. How can I balance this? And the Bible tells us that there's a, there is a divide of hostility and that only Jesus has, has, branched, has bridged that. And he bridged that not by anything else he's done, but by who he is. And the hostility he's talking about is between us and God. He is our peace. But following him, he said to us, that if you follow me, you will have peace with God, but you'll be at war with the world. Peace with God means war with the world. The values of our culture and our society are the exact opposite for the most part of of what God would have for us. And so the closer you move towards the world, the more you move away from God. And so Jesus says, listen, I am your peace because I have now reconciled you to God. But that very reconciliation now sets you in opposition to the world. So blessed are the peacemakers are not about this idea of of looking on the world politically or in, in violence, but saying, no, no, the peace is something different. But now here's the second part. And the second part really helps us to understand the peace part. Because remember what it says, blessed are the peacemakers for what? They will be called children of God. It's the second part that defines the first part. Let me explain to you. So in the ancient world, names were important. Names were important in the ancient world. Allowing someone to take your name for, uh, for themselves, show trust that the person would uphold your honor and name and not blemish it or profane it. Hence the reason for the third commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain. There is meaning in a name that must be respected. So in the ancient, in ancient world, and somewhat today, but not as much so, a name meant something. The family you came from meant something. And if you were the oldest male, that's just the way the culture was, you represented the family. And you represented the family in society, in business, in dealings, and all of that. Therefore, the onus upon you to act and behave a certain way was huge. Now, in Galatians 4, Paul says something very interesting, and he makes a very a direct connection to this beatitude. It says this, But when, this t- when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that me- we might receive adoption to sonship. This is interesting. Now, the phrase Paul is using here is actually a legal Roman phrase, and I want to unpack it for a second. But Paul says something very interesting here. That why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus arrive on this planet? Because he wanted to adopt us. You know, you ever go by a, a, a pet store and you see the puppies in the glass? Right? You're like, oh, look at that one. Not that one, but that one there, right? Well, that's God. God walks by humanity and sees us in the glass. And, but instead of saying one, God says, like, I want all of them. I, I want all of them. Right? Like, that's, that's God's heart. He wants all of us. Right? So Paul uses a phrase here, adoption to sonship. Now, I'll explain to you what that means. It is not with any exaggeration to say that the central theme of the gospel is adoption. So one of the things we forget about is why is the gospel good news? Why, why is salvation so important? Because what we have done, and for various reasons, is we've gone to salvation as like, oh, I don't get to go to hell. That may be true, but if that's your focus, that will no longer be true, Right? There's actually something more profound going on here. And the, and, and the profundity of what Jesus is talking about is actually about this idea of being welcomed into a new family, right? Um, some of the greatest stories I think that we have out there, whether it's Harry Potter or C.S. Lewis or, or Tolkien or a, a, any of these great writers out there and older writers, there's other ones as well too. But this idea of go, coming from someplace that not being the representative to go to another place, like being adopted into a new family, into a new understanding of this world, right? Well, Paul is saying the same thing to us. Now watch this. 
In the Roman law and culture of the first century AD, an affluent but childless adult who wanted an heir would adopt a post-pubescent male, often a slave, to be his son. So imagine this for a second. You are a, a Roman in your household. You have no heirs, no boys. Unfortunately, in, in Roman culture, women could not inherit, right? They could, it had to go through the men. And again, you can, you can uh, protest that, the first century Roman Empire, all you want, right? But that's just the way it was. So if you were a male and you were getting on an age and you didn't have any heirs, the next best thing is to look at a slave. Now, when you hear the word slave, you can have absolutely some horrible connotations. But in Roman culture, especially polite Roman culture, this is not to say this is always the way, but in Roman culture, um, some of the slaves uh, that were uh, a part of the family were actually very close in relationship and were treated quite well. And you had your chance to say, okay, you know what? This one who's been with our family for decades, who is wise, understands the business, I'm now going to adopt them. Now, here's what's interesting. is This person goes from being a slave to now being an heir. And the transformation is startling because at one point in time, their life was owned by somebody. They had to follow orders, get up in the morning, work for somebody else. And then one day, the owner of the household says, no, 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 no. When I die, this all becomes yours. You become the master of the household. You become the owner of all things. And all my riches are given to you. And more importantly, my name so that my family will not die when I die. And do you know what was interesting as well too? Deaths did not go past death. So this, this male slave would inherit, he would inherit whatever the, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, his, the past, but he would not get the deaths. There was, a, there was a, a ratio of how much debt could go forward after death. So imagine this, you live your entire life being owned by a person. And, and again, because these slaves would be the ones that would be the more intelligent ones, you weren't treated too badly, but still, getting up in the morning and, and taking care of the household and, and doing this because this is your job, to now all of a sudden doing it because this is now your inheritance. So Paul uses the phrase in Galatians, adoption to sonship. And the early church, Galatia, Philippi especially, these were Gentile, these were Roman colonies, and they'd realize this word. And some of them would be like, the, 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 the moment of like, is he serious? That all of a sudden, we go from slaves to owners? Now, remember the language talk, uh, talking about those of us who have not encountered Christ yet. Slaves to sin. We're slaves to sin. And all of a sudden, the owner of the household says, you're no longer a slave, but you're a son. You're a daughter. And the transformation is astounding. Because now, once you were serving other people, now you stand at the, at the honored place in the house and a new robe and there's a whole ritual of clothing and being introduced to people as well too. This is now my son. And you're taking out into, into society and introduced as a son. And what the father would do would start train you how to take everything over because one day soon he will be gone and this is all yours. So it's an incredible transformation, but that's the language that Paul is using here. Um, parents expected the children to bring both honor and longevity to the family name. Children inherited the wealth of their parents and also received the full effects of the family name, honor, responsibility, tra- traditions, and position. Now, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Right? Here's the point, though. In Matthew 7, Jesus is very interesting here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. If that doesn't freak you out, that one sentence there, you're not reading it properly. Because what is interesting here is he says this, the verbal proclamation, but the living opposite of that is not good enough. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what does he say? But only the one who does what? The will of my father in he- who is in heaven. So it's not just enough to say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm going to check that box off in a census. It's not even enough to show up to church every Sunday and proclaim God on a Sunday morning and live however you want for the rest of the six days of the week. That Lord, Lord piece is very interesting because what Jesus is saying is, you must be about the will of my Father. There is a disconnect, and I think it's, it's, it's been in the church for, since its beginning, 
But there's been a disconnect between, oh, I can proclaim, I can call myself, I can self-identify as this. But what God says is, the only ones who really enter into heaven are those who are about the will of my Father. And so Jesus says something very interesting here. He says, listen, it's not good enough for you to say, I am this, but instead, you are ha- you must be about my will. Now, I'll explain to you what that is in a second here, but basically to be a child of God was to speak for God, represent God in this world. If you are now adopted by God, if you are now brought into his family, you go from slave now to son, sonship, now you, you now bear the name of God. You are his representative in the world. And as his representative in the world, you are expected and, 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 and called on to act and behave in a certain way. So what does that mean? It means that in order for you to be called a child of God, you must be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they will be called children of God. A peacemaker isn't a person out there who is nice, who gets along with everybody. But a peacemaker is a person who's out there who is proclaiming God's name into a world that is hostile to God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are part of the family of God. At UCC, we use a phrase uh, to talk about what we are. You can call us a church. That's fine. You can call us a community. That's also fine. But what we really are is spiritual family. And what spiritual family means is you don't have to like everybody. Because nobody likes everybody in their family. I have one of my sisters here. They know that. There's times where you fight in your family. But the thing is, though, you're still family. You get to family reunions, right? And you see this very often because I I, I get to do uh, a few weddings. You see the family dynamics happen, especially on the rehearsal evening. Right, the rehearsal evening of the two families, right, and and you have you know the you know, the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom are like looking at each other across the way there, and you know they're like kind of eyeing each other, stinking eyeing each other, and all that, right, and 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 usually the the the, the bride and groom will kind of give me the heads up of like, oh, my mom's gonna try to do this, or my dad, I'm like, okay, it's okay, I got this, right. So at a rehearsal, I always say the same thing, and for those of you who've been at one of my rehearsals, you know this. I I I, I will say something like this. Thanks for coming. My name is Pastor Raja. I'll be officiating. The bride and groom and I have already arranged this entire ceremony, so we're not going to really change anything. And the unspoken thing is don't mess with it, all right? We've already put it together. We're not going to change anything like that, so just, just, just put it together. But the interesting thing about that is that two families are coming together in a marriage. And the reality is the bride and groom love each other, obviously, but we don't really know how the relationship goes out from there. And as these two families come together to reception, you see it a little bit and all that. And the thing is, though, the best representation, the best terminology for a church is not church, because that has a whole bunch of different connotations, building even. It's not even community, because I'll tell you this right now. There are people who are not Christians who have community. But the best representation of who we are is spiritual family. Because in spiritual family, you cannot agree with everyone. You don't even have to like everyone, but you know that something binds you together that transcends the physical relationships that you have. And Jesus tells us that we are children of God. So who's the parent? God. Who's his children? We are. Do the siblings always get along? No. But we always look to the Father. Right? That is a better understanding of church today, and we've lost that. And at UCC, we talk about that all the time, that we are trying to be spiritual family. Not always great, not always perfect, right? But that's not the point, though. The point is that we are, we are united together in something that's greater, that transcends all of us. If you want to read the Beatitude in a different way, I've rewrote it so it kind of brings out a lot of these truths, and it goes like this. It is a blessing to help others find peace with their creator by showing them what authentic relationship with God looks like. These people are worthy to be called children of their heavenly father. That's how the beatitude, if you expand all the themes that are in it, should be read. It is a blessing to help others find peace with their creator. It is a blessing if you are somebody who doesn't just simply call yourself a Christian, but acts like one. And you know what acting like a Christian is? It's not about taking your Bible out and hitting people about it. It's not getting in arguments with people on on social media. It's self-sacrificial. It's serving people even when it hurts. It's giving your life away to others around you who don't even like you, who don't even believe the same as you. 
right? That's what being a Christ follower looks like. And when we act and behave in those ways, people look at us like, huh, like, like, why do you act this way? Why do you behave this way? And that's when we respond because of, of, of what God's done in us. And that's how we become peacemakers, by being people who show that our relationship with God is authentic, not just uh, something we talk about on Sundays, right? That's a peacemaker. And then what does the Bible tell us? That when we live in that type of a, a relational context, we are then worthy to be called children of God. We are then worthy to be called children of God. This beatitude is a direct connection. It's the evangelism. It's the, uh, it's the outreach. It's our mission. It is looking forward. But it connects two pieces together. It doesn't say, yeah, you know what? Go out there in the world and tell people about Jesus. That's not it. It's peace. And you know what was interesting is that when you look at Hebrew culture, there's a word that they use for peace called shalom. Right? Shalom is a very interesting word because it means peace. It's a greeting and it's also a goodbye. But it means more than just peace. It actually means harmony. And I actually thought that would be, when I started kind of digging into the word that Jesus used, I actually thought that's the word I would find. But see, shalom actually is, is, is too light of a word, as one commentator said, that what Jesus was trying to convey was deeper. That, that there is a conflict within our spirits. There's a conflict within this world. And we as Christ followers, bearers of the spirit, keepers of the light, however you want to use a phrase, we have that peace. And our job is to go into the world and give that peace to others, to show that peace to other people. Because that peace is a peace that cannot be shaken by your finances, by your relationships, by your political situation, by even what the world is around you. It's why a guy like Nelson Mandela and others around the world today, men and women who are in prison because of their faith, have something that we don't understand. They can be in prison. They can be beaten. They can have everything taken away from them, but still have God's peace because it's something that transcends the physical surroundings that you have. That's what a peacemaker looks like. And every man and woman around this world that is proclaiming the gospel, however they want to do it, with words, with their lives, with their behavior, their actions, all these things together, they are peacemakers. And they are worthy to be called children of God. Which is interesting because that means some people are unworthy to be called children of God. Lord, 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 did we not all do all these things? And God's like, get away. The only people who can call me Lord, the only people who are my children who do my will. That's the children of God. Let me close. Paul in 2 Corinthians really paints this beautiful picture. And I, I was going to use this passage a little earlier on, but I thought I would kind of uh, bring it towards the end. 2 Corinthians 5. I, I think it's kind of a somewhat of a famous passage. I refer to it a lot because it's just a beautiful picture of what this whole peacemaker children of God thing looks like. So all this is from God. And again, this is Paul kind of summing up a little bit uh, on top of the scripture there. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the message of uh, the ministry of reconciliation. So what's he saying here? Before we could be reconciled to God, Jesus' death upon the cross, right, was that reconciliation piece, right? So before that time, humanity and God were separated. Right? And, and, and the sacrifice system and all that was in place to bridge it, but it was only a temporary bridge. Because even the writer of Hebrews says, sacrifice time and time again, it just, it's not enough. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, goes to the cross, sinless, perfect, and, and, and he pays that price. He reconciles us. So Paul says to the church in Corinth, listen, before you try to act in a certain way, before you start to behave a certain way, understand God has already paid the price for us, right? He has reconciled us. But then he says this, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He unpacks that. The message of reconciliation is this, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not counting people's sins against them. What fun is that? Because it's not what we like to do, tell people how bad they are before they come to God. Make them crawl a little bit more? Don't we like that? Don't we want to tell people how awful they are? Not counting their sins against them. Why? The new creation, right? It's this new creation. It's a piece of us that says, you know what? You can be, this is your past. 
And you can be ashamed of it. You can look at it. You can weep. You can cry. But when you encounter Jesus, the new has come. The old is gone. That's reconciliation. That's true reconciliation. And that's why we as a church always want to make sure that we treat people not as they were, but as they are. And I as a pastor, I probably, I probably do this a little bit too much, but I look at not just the person as they are, but the potential of what they could be. It doesn't mean I don't get disappointed. It just means that in each person, I see this, this spark of the Holy Spirit that can take them and transform them and just use them whatever way God wants them to right? That's the message of reconciliation. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Like, could Paul use this word more in a sentence as he's trying to like just get this hammer this home for the Corinthians? Now look at it, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the piece there that's terrifying, horrifying. That people may never go to a church, people may never go to a church service, read a Bible, but they'll meet you. And you might be the only God they'll meet. What kind of God would that be? What kind of person would that be? You are Christ's ambassadors. And the whole concept of ambassador is simply this, is that even in a foreign country, an embassy, an ambassador is somebody who is from the other country but speaks for that country, in, that con- in, the, in the visiting country. Right? And so what's, Jesus, what's, what's Paul saying to us? That we are in this world, but we are not of this world, John chapter 17. Right? That we are ambassadors for God, that we go out into this world, and this world is hostile towards God. This world doesn't uh, believe the values, but we don't get to that part. We go, listen, let me explain to you what God means to me. And this is why I always say, people say to me sometimes that, oh, pastor, I was having this conversation. They asked me this question. I didn't know the answer. I wish you were there. I'm like, it's not that Christianity is a cognitive thing. It's not about thinking all the time. Yes, we need to use our minds to glorify God, but sometimes we forget it's our testimonies. It's about our stories with God, right? It's, it's what Craig taught us last week, right, in Ephesians 4 and 5, this, this new creation, right, that we can have this life, but once we encounter Jesus, we are different. Now, not perfect, not altogether. Yes, we fall. Yes, we fail. But that's not the part that we look at. We say, God, what do you want for us? We are your ambassadors. We are fallen, broken ambassadors, but we are ambassadors nonetheless. And we, we live out your will. We want to be your children. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This beatitude takes us from the mercy to, to the comfort, all that now, and sends us out into the world. This is our commissioning to go into the world. And it's, only, it's interesting to me, that we don't get commissioned to step number seven. We got six steps to go through before we got to this point, right? We got six beatitudes to get through to get to this point here because God doesn't want to send us out in the world angry, self-righteous, full of ourselves, talking about ourselves without, without God. Let me tell you about this, this, this way of thinking. Let me talk about this philosophical method. God's like, no, no, no. Once you've gone through these steps here, that inner transformation has happened. The humility, the, the necessity, the hunger, the appetites, all that's been addressed now by the cross. And now you get to go in the world. You get to be a peacemaker for me. And because you do this, you are worthy to be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Let's pray. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, we do this every week. I'm not going to make you do anything, but I do want to make you think. I, I, I use this space... It's an opportunity for you to reflect because my hope and my prayer is the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And the question I'm hoping he's asking you right now is, are you a peacemaker? By speech or by deed, by behavior, are you a peacemaker? Are you an ambassador for God in your school, at home, at work, with your friends? A peacemaker isn't a person that's trying to make people be friends, but a peacemaker is somebody who's out there showing what an authentic relationship with their creator looks like. A peacemaker is not perfect. A peacemaker doesn't have scriptures memorized. A peacemaker doesn't have all the answers. A peacemaker is just simply out there saying, there's a God, and this is what he's done in my life. This is how he's changed me. This is how he's transformed me. He can do the same for you. Let me invite you into that peaceful relationship with your creator.
Because in that moment, if you are acting and behaving that way, you are then worthy to be called a child of God. A child of God. It's so interesting to me that God connects peacemaker with children of God. He could have used that phrase at any point in the Beatitudes, but he saves it for the peacemaker piece. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for everybody who's gathered here on this um, holiday weekend. We, we appreciate that so much. Lord, I thank you that you are our peace, Lord Jesus. That you've gone to the cross and you've provided a way for each one of us a path to authentic relationship with you, Lord Jesus. That no longer do we look from the outside of what God is doing, but instead that we are now inside. Lord, no longer are we slaves, slaves to our appetites, our desires, our sins. But instead, we all in this room can proclaim with certainty and with boldness that we are children, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are sons of Abraham, daughters of Abraham in this room. And Lord, I pray that we would not forget that we are peacemakers, that we are people who are trying to help others to understand what a relationship with God looks like. Lord, this world is so broken. I encounter people every day who are weighed down by sin, by their choices, by their by choices of others, and they feel like they have no release, no freedom. I pray, God, you would use me, you would use each and every one of us to help those people to know that there's a different way And Lord, our circumstances may not change, but we change. We are transformed by your spirit, by your sacrifice in our lives. God, help us to be peacemakers because we are children of God. We desire, we long to be children of God. Let it be said of Uptown Community Church that it's not a church, it's not a community, but it's a spiritual family. Men and women who bear one another's burdens, who are there for each other to cry, to weep, to rejoice, to celebrate in all circumstances. That is what we want, Lord. That is what we long for. Let nobody in this room feel on the outside that they are not a part of this, but instead, Lord, that they would realize that as in this room are people who care deeply for them, even if they don't know them. Make us peacemakers so that we can be children of God and we can look to heaven and declare God our Father. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for this time of teaching. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd continue to impress upon us. You'd continue to remind us of it during the week, Lord, and for the rest of our lives, really. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.